Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for a beautiful day that you have made. It is a day that you have made, and so we rejoice in it. We rejoice in you. We rejoice in all that you are doing among us and in us and with us and through us. Lord, we just sang, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Lord, we do pray that we would be living sanctuaries for you. And that we would, in fact, just praise you and thank you continuously with how we live the lives that you have given to us. Now, Lord, we are starting a new book of the Bible today. And we pray, O oh Lord, we would learn the lessons that are within it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to start Esther. Esther is an interesting little book. I think it's about ten chapters, nine or ten. Very interesting. The historical context of Esther, Esther is that it was during the Babylonian captivity. Um, in actuality, it may have been beyond that captivity. Um, I was looking at some of the records this morning about that, and um, it appears that some of the people of, Israel, of Judah had already gone back. And, and started working on rebuilding and so forth, because the time in which she lived was in the 5th century uh, B.C., and the Babylonian captivity, those 70 years that Jeremiah spoke of, would have been over in the latter part of the 6th century. So this is a little bit further down than that. So kind of hard to tell, but anyway... There certainly were Jews living in uh, Susa, or as you will see it here, it's Sushan. Depends upon you know the translation. Anyway, how it was that the, the Medes and the Persians ended up over the territory that had been Babylon? Remember, in Daniel's book. There was a fellow by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And, well, his son became king after Nebuchadnezzar died. His son had seen everything and knew of everything that had happened in his father's life, including the seven years that his father's mind had become that of an animal. And he went out and he ate grass and, you know, the hair on his, on his body grew like feathers on a bird and his claws. Claws. His fingernails became like claws of a bird. And his son saw all of this, because I'm sure he was co-regent while his father was mad out there, you know, acting like a, you know, an animal. And uh, when his father, father's mind returned, you know, his kingdom was given back to him, and then eventually his father died, and, and Belshazzar became king, and... Even though he knew what had happened to his father, he did not honor God. And so at one point, he gave a feast, and he declared that all of the vessels, the, the chalices and so forth, that had belonged in the temple of God, be brought out, and they would feast with those, and they were drinking wine, and they were praising the gods of silver and gold and so forth, and all of a sudden... As he is doing that and everybody's feasting, he sees a hand writing on the wall and he can't make it out and none of his advisors can make it out. And his mother or his grandmother, it's kind of unclear as to which one it was, said, when your father, Nebuchadnezzar, was king, there was a man in the area who was one of his regents, he could go ahead and translate these things and, you know, visions and so forth. So call for Daniel. He'll come and figure it out for you. And Daniel came in, and first he chastised Belshazzar. For even though he knew everything that had happened to his father, he still did not honor the God of heaven 
who had held his life in his hands. And so he read the inscription. The inscription was Mene 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 Tetel Uplarsen. And that meant your life has been put in a balance and has been found wanting. Your days, you're over. They're over, basically. And uh, your kingdom is being given over to the Medes and the Persians. Well, Daniel was absolutely correct that night. The Medes and the Persians came in and Belshazzar was killed. and So that's how that worked out. That's where we get the saying, the handwriting's on the wall. Yeah, that's where we get it from. Because, the, I mean, basically all he saw was a finger. Oh, he saw the writing, but he saw the finger writing it. And I imagine that would shake you up pretty bad. And it shook him up. I mean, his face turned pale and his knees were knocking and he's like, and none of his spiritual advisors could help him out in any way. And, but his mother knew. Call Daniel. He'll tell you what it is. And he did. And so now what we have is the same territory that the Babylonians had held. Now it belongs to the Medes and the Persians. But there are still people there from Judah living there. Not everybody went back to Judah. Some of them made their homes there and stayed there. So now that's kind of the backdrop of this. So we're going to read that. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This was Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. Just consider how large a territory that is. I mean, India is over here, Ethiopia is in Africa. It's like, wow. So, India to Ethiopia. Now, Ahasuerus, his other name is Xerxes I, which is a whole lot easier to say than Ahasuerus. And I'm not swearing when I say Ahasuerus. It's Ahasuerus. So anyway, in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Sushan, or Susa, the citadel, and in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and, the, and Medea, the nobles and the princes and provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all, for a whole half a year, they're feasting. And he's showing off all this splendor. And when these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Sushan the citadel from great to small in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords of fine linen and purple on silver rods and marble pillars. And the couches were of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise, and white and black marble. And they served drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other, with royal wine in abundance, according to the generosity of the king. In accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory, for so the king had ordered all the officers of his household that they should do according to each man's pleasure. Queen Vashti also made a feast for all the women in the royal palace, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, uh, Besda, Harbona, Bigtha, Agbatha, Zether, and Carcass, seven eunuchs, who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus to bring Queen Vashti before the king wearing her royal crown in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials, for she was beautiful to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command brought by his eunuchs. Therefore the king was furious and his anger burned within him. Then the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for this was the king's manner 
toward all those who knew law and justice, those closest to him being Karshena, Sether, Admatha, Tarshish, Meres, Marsena, and Memukan, the seven princes of Persia and Medea, who had access to the king's presence and who ranked highest in the kingdom. What shall we do to Queen Vashti according to the law? Because she did not obey the command of King Ahasuerus brought to her by the eunuchs. And Memukan answered before the king and the princes, Queen Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also all the princes and all the people who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will become known to all women, so that they will despise their husbands in their eyes when they report King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought in before him, but she did not come. This very day, the noble lady, ladies of Persia and Medea will say to all the king's officials that they have heard of the behavior of the queen. Thus, there will be excessive contempt and wrath. If it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out from him and let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it will not be altered that Vashti, shall no long shall come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. When the king's decree which he will make is proclaimed throughout all his empire, for it is great, all wives will honor their husbands, both great and small. And the reply pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Memukan. Then he sent letters to all the king's provinces, to each province in its own script, and to every people in their own language, that each man should be master in his own house and speak in the language of his own people. You know, you got to have the background. At least they didn't say, off with Vashti's head. All she's not able to do is come before the king anymore, so that's a good thing. At least they didn't ax her completely. What they did with her, I don't know, but she never came before the king again. But it's like, how dare she have a mind of her own? <laughs> anyway, you know, one of the interesting things about the book of Esther is God is never mentioned. God is not mentioned in this book. But as you're going to read it, you'll know that God is working. All right. You know, God's working. Chapter 2. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be brought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Sushan and to Sushan the citadel into the women's quarters under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custody of the women, custodian of the women. And let beauty preparations be given them. And let the young women who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. In Shushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah. The other name for Jeconiah is King Jehoiachin. King Jehoiachin of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther. Hadassah's name is Esther, okay? So, and Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter, raising her up. 
So it was when the king's command and decree were heard, and when many young women were gathered at Shushan the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace into the care of Haggai, this custodian of the women. Notice, it doesn't look like any of these women could say, no, 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 I don't want to go. Okay? And they went along and said, you're beautiful, come. You know, there you go. And then you're going to have your beauty treatments. <laughs> so, now the young woman pleased him. Esther pleased him, Haggai, the custodian of the young women. Now the young woman pleased him. So who's behind that? God is, even though he's not mentioned. Now the young woman pleased him and she obtained his favor. So he readily gave beauty preparations to her besides her allowance. Sounds like she got more than everybody else. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. So see, the favor of the Lord is with her. Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. Probably so. There's God working too, you know. And, you know, as we read through Esther, we'll see that that's going to that's gonna be the ace in the hole that God's going to have. God always has his aces in the hole. You know, it may look terrible to us, but God's, God's got his, you know, he's got his hand going. He knows what's going on. So Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what, it ha what was happening to her. So he never gave up that charge to be you know, attentive to her and what's going on with her. I mean, he took this very, very seriously. Each young woman's turn came to go in to King Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months preparation, a whole year. That's according to the regulations for the women. For thus were the days of their preparation apportioned, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying omen. Okay? The, yes, it's, yeah, it's like, <laughs> it, it is bad, you know. It's just like, thus prepared each young woman went to the king. And she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the woman's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women, to the custody of Shashgaz, the king's eunuch who kept the concubines. So, see, these are concubines. Okay? Uh, so she would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. Okay? You've had your beauty treatments, you've gone into the king, but he's not going to have you ever again unless he calls you by name. <clears throat> now, when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head, made her queen instead of Vashti. Now, she became queen in 478 B.C. Then the king made a great feast, the Feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants, and he proclaimed a holiday. 
in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. When virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people just as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Big Fan and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. That's not all the story, but <clears throat> everything that you're seeing so far is going to, you know, we'll see it a little bit later. What has happened now with Mordecai and the fact that, you know, he has spared the king's life by telling Esther what's going on with these two guys, Big Fan and Teresh, uh, is going to come into play a little bit later. The fact that she's not revealing who she is and what her people is, that's going to come in later. You know, all of these, it's building up to what's going to be happening. Uh, Esther's a really fantastic read. It, it doesn't take long. Uh, I mean, there's a whole, we'll hear about it, uh, but, but the, but the uh, celebration of Purim, every year the Jews celebrate Purim because of what went on with Esther. And so we're going to hear all about that and what's going on there. But it's very interesting in that, you know, the king's word was the king's word. These women didn't have a choice. If they were beautiful, they were brought in. And the king could say, and they were they underwent the beauty treatments, and the, and you know the king's word was the king's word. It probably took them a, a while, and then these beauty treatments for one year. So I, you know, yes, yes. Uh, in fact, um, I think. Um, you see, what happened is, is that uh, it was the third year of his reign when he held this feast, and I believe it was the seventh year of his reign when she was declared the uh, queen in Vashti's place. So four years. 